Oh boy, this is going to be a hard one. So in my recent In Defense of videos, I've primarily defended some of America's founding fathers, such as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, whose real main criticism about them was the slavery question. Well, today I'm going to talk about someone who is completely different, as I defend Andrew Jackson. Yikes. Um, please don't be too mean to me in the comment section, guys. Part 1. The Trail of Tears Like my past two videos, I've decided I'm just going to jump straight into the controversy and discuss the Trail of Tears. Before I attempt to defend Jackson, I do feel that it is a very underrepresented historical topic when we talk about Native American history. So, I believe a brief history is in order. Prior to Jackson's removal of the Indians to the West, there were considered five civilized tribes that held land east of the Mississippi River in America's South. Though other Native American groups did live in the East and in the South, these tribes were the most assimilated into American culture, which they believed this would be their shield towards encroachment from white settlers. The five civilized tribes were the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and the most assimilated were the Cherokees, but more on them later. Unfortunately for these tribes, many politicians and white settlers wanted to inhabit their land, as westward expansion was occurring. Eventually, Congress would pass the Indian Removal Act, which required the five civilized tribes to move to Indian Territory, which is in modern-day Oklahoma. According to supporters of the bill, including Jackson himself, the Indians would be threatened by an onslaught of white settlers, and by moving them west, this would allow them to continue their lifestyle. Basically, in other words, Jacksonian Democrats believed they were preventing future wars with the Indians. Despite the Indian Removal Act passing, it had strong congressional opposition, with the act barely passing. Nevertheless, the bill passed, and Jackson was given authority to make treaties with the five civilized tribes, and it created the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a government organization that's still around today. A little known fact about the bill was initially it was supposed to allow the natives to stay on their land if they chose to do so. However, through threats, coercion, and trickery, the United States got all of them to comply. The Choctaw were the first tribe which was going to be moved west. Initially, the Mississippi state government abolished the Choctaw's tribe, which would later be ruled unconstitutional, but I'll get to that later. By destroying their authority and their autonomy, Mississippi's government forced the local Choctaw chiefs to sign the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit, which forced the Choctaw to move to Indian Territory during the winter. Nearly one-fourth of the Choctaw did not survive the journey. The Chickasaw were the next tribe to be moved to Indian Territory. Unlike the Choctaw, the Chickasaw handled their own removal process and did so voluntarily. As a result, they had a much easier time moving to Oklahoma than the other tribes did. Yet, the news of the Choctaw's struggle soon spread to the three remaining civilized tribes. For instance, the Creek staged an uprising against the American government, which led to many Creek being forced to Indian Territory in chains. Yeah, that's, that's depressing. According to the records, 3,000 Creek Indians did not survive the journey. The Seminoles are a very, very interesting case because their rebellion basically worked. They were able to keep a lot of their land in Florida, which they still live to to this day. In fact, Florida State's mascot is the Seminoles because of this rebellion. This now brings me to the Cherokee, who were considered the most civilized tribe of the five tribes. Due to how assimilated the Cherokee were, they hoped that they would be able to keep their land. And, frankly, they had a point. The Cherokee had an English newspaper. They had a constitution, and schools were taught in English. I do believe the Cherokee could have kept their land if it wasn't for the discovery of gold in Georgia. Despite the state of Georgia demanding that the Cherokee leave, the Cherokee sued to stay on their land, and they won their Supreme Court case. According to Chief Justice John Marshall, only the federal government had the authority to deal with Native Americans, not the state. Now, this is where history starts to diverge a bit, and I want to set the record straight. It is common for people to blame Andrew Jackson entirely for the removal of the Cherokee Indians, which is not completely fair. 
Often they cite the misquote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it, as evidence to Jackson wanting to remove the Cherokee Indians. First, that is not Jackson's actual quote. He really said, and I quote, The decision of the Supreme Court has fell still, born, and they find that they cannot coerce Georgia to yield to its mandate. Not as catchy, obviously, but I get how the John Marshall quote is catchier, which is why we remember it to this day. Anyway, did everyone know that the removal of the Cherokee, otherwise known as the Trail of Tears, did not happen under Jackson's presidency? Well, it's true. It actually happened during Martin Van Buren's presidency, which, fun fact, is the only president in U.S. history whose native language isn't English, the more you know. Before you say, say it, Jackson critics, yes, the Trail of Tears did not happen under Jackson's presidency, but he still outlined the plans for Van Buren, but Van Buren continued them. I do believe that is unfair to claim this, though, because Van Buren could have easily followed through with John Marshall's ruling, and he could have prepared a much better logistics plan for the Cherokee's removal out west. The fact is, the other four tribes can completely be blamed on Jackson, but the Cherokee, which is probably the most tragic of them, is not solely his fault, and historically, we need to shift some of the blame to Van Buren, who stood idly by while these atrocities went on. I've also mentioned as well how local state governments had a huge impact on the removal of local Native Americans. For instance, we don't blame the Mississippi state government. Instead, we just blame Jackson. Moreover, Winfield Scott was the commander of the removal of the Cherokee to Oklahoma, and he was responsible for the logistics of the march. Under Scott's command, the Cherokee did not have shoes, blankets, and food provided for them. Their food was even rotten during their travels. In my opinion, Scott's failure of logistics and providing adequate aid to the Cherokee is a huge reason why the, Cher the Trail of Tears was as bad as it was. In the end, 4,000 Cherokee died during the Trail of Tears, and it should be remembered as one of the darkest moments in American history. Now, I'm going to share some controversial opinions that you might disagree with, but please just hear me out because frankly, I think it needs to be said, especially when understanding the time period. Today, we see the removal of the Native Americans as disgusting, and frankly, one of the most morally reprehensible actions in American history. As a native North Carolinian, the Cherokee Reservation is a few hours from where I live, so I've seen the poverty firsthand. But when it comes to Indian removal, I unfortunately think that it was inevitable. If you look at the previous 300 years before the Indian Removal Act, white settlers have been constantly at odds with natives. Famously, white settlers massacred natives during the King Philip's War, and the conquistadors destroyed the great Mayan empire. Heck, a major cause of the American Revolution was the Proclamation Line of 1763, which barred white settlers from going west of the Appalachian Mountains, in fear that they would come into conflict with Native American groups. My point is, with or without Jackson, the natives would have been moved. And frankly, they would come into conflicts with pioneers who believed in manifest destiny. We can't solely blame Jackson's presidency. Like, even after Jackson's presidency, we saw how settlers would continue to encroach on native land, even in Indian territory. The Battle of Little Bighorn and the Indian Wars fought out west happened 40 years after Jackson's presidency, under leaders that we would consider pretty aligned with our modern day values. It is a sad thought, but American settlers taking over the whole country and not leaving much for the natives was an inevitable historical trend, and we might kick and scream and be sad about it, but we're just playing Monday Monday morning quarterbacking if we if we do. But without these disgusting acts, I think the United States would be a shell of itself. Okay, that was dark, and I'm sorry if it makes you upset, and I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. So, History Channel guy... Can we talk about something else a little more fun? Maybe some of Jackson's ridiculous antics? Well, thank God you asked, because we can right now. Part 2. 
Jackson was insane. A common thing I hear about Andrew Jackson is how he was too crazy to become president. And most of that can be cited with his crazy White House party and his habit of dueling. So I'll first address the White House party. As many of you know, after Andrew Jackson won the presidency, he had a giant inauguration party, which quickly got out of control. Apparently during that party, people were throwing food everywhere, destroying furniture, and even crushing cheese into the White House carpets. Hmm. Interesting. Apparently the threat of Jackson's life was so bad that a group of friends had to make a human shield around him so that he could escape out of the White House. Now, in today's politics, this would never be acceptable. But honestly, I don't have a huge problem with the White House party. These were Jackson's supporters, and they were really, really excited about him winning. Remember, to many Americans, Jackson was the champion of the common man. And for the first time in American history, the common man just won the presidency. Just think back to how elite John Quincy Adams was, and how Jackson was previously cheated out of the presidency through the corrupt bargain. I have no problem with the American people getting wasted and having a huge party. So, let's put this issue to rest, shall we? But History Channel guy, what about the duels? How can someone be president who literally kills people as a way of solving their grievances? Well, that's a great question. But I think you really have to understand the historical nature of dueling. Jackson was a Southern man, and a very common belief in the South was dueling was the best way of preserving your personal or family's honor. In fact, Jackson's most famous duel against Charles Dickinson was completely legal under Tennessee law. But I'm going to get off topic here because I need to tell you about this duel. So Jackson and Dickinson hated each other, mostly because both men were horse breeders and they both disagreed immensely on politics. Well, Dickinson had the foolish idea to call Jackson's wife a bigamist because apparently Jackson and her married before her previous marriage was ended, which is technically adultery. It's the definition of 19th century drama, but this would be a common insult towards Jackson his whole life. Anyway, Dickinson was a very experienced duelist, and he had even killed 26 men dueling, and he definitely believed that Jackson would be number 27. Wanting to get rid of Jackson politically, they agreed to a duel. Jackson knew that he wasn't a good enough marksman to fire the first shot, so, like a true gentleman, he allowed Dickinson to have the first shot. Dickinson aimed to kill, as he aimed for Jackson's heart, and he hit him. But somehow, our future president stayed up and steadied himself for his first shot. According to the gentleman rules of dueling, you were to stay completely still for someone's second shot, meaning Dickinson was a sitting duck. Jackson shot and killed Charles Dickinson, all while being shot in the chest. After the duel, a doctor was amazed that Jackson was still on his feet. After being shot, Jackson reportedly said he would have killed Dickinson even if he shot him in the brain. What a badass. See, I find stories like this not only to be interesting, but really, really funny. Some estimates have Jackson being involved in 103 duels. At the time, this was a gentleman's way to solve disputes, so I have no issue with it. I frankly wish they would bring back duels today. Anyway, I have no issues with any of the crazy Jackson stories, like him being called Old Hickory because he used to beat people with a hickory cane, or any of the other stuff. In fact, some of these stories came from the election of 1828, which is considered the first modern-day political election. During this campaign, John Quincy Adams did a lot of mudslinging against Jackson, including the bigamous claims against his wife, um, outlining his temper and history with duels. It is likely many of these stories were untrue, but they were certainly sensationalized. Either way, Jackson is known for being crazy, but many of these stories I find either very funny and sometimes admirable. I wish presidents would act like this today instead of being bore boring stiff ne necks we see in modern day politics. Jackson was true to himself. Like, his biggest regrets in life that was that he didn't shoot Henry Clay and didn't hang John C. Calhoun. That's pretty badass if you ask me. Part 3. 
Jackson started the Panic of 1837. Another criticism I've heard about Jackson is how he started the Panic of 1837 through his terrible economic policies during his presidency. Before we dive into it, no, I'm not going to blame Van Buren for the panic because it happened under his presidency. Unlike Indian relations, economic issues such as recessions take multiple years to occur, and Van Buren did not have the power to stop it. Though I do believe that Jackson and his actions towards the pet banks did contribute to the Panic of 1837, I also believe many of his economic actions were justified. The Second Bank of the United States was given a 20-year charter in 1816, which gave the bank the rights to be the United States financial agent. This meant that the central bank made deposits, gave out loans, and regulated the United States currency by issuing banknotes and transferring cash between states. The initial idea behind the charter was that the president and Congress would oversee the bank's activities, yet over 80% of the bank was owned by wealthy elites. To many rural voters, who we have to remember are Jackson's base, the Second Bank of the United States gave away m much of the influence to foreign investors, which hurt the working man. Personally, Jackson questioned the constitutionality of the Second Bank, and he thought the bank was ripe with corruption, which he was right. Instead of a central bank, Jackson believed that the individual state should have the power to control the United States' monetary policies. Knowing how unpopular the bank was to Jackson, the Second Bank's president wanted to force the renewal of the charter in 1832 instead of 1836, because it could be used against Jackson during his re-election campaign. Believing the bank held too much power, Jackson vetoed a bill renewing the bank, a classic Jackson veto if I've ever seen one myself. Not wanting to anger Jacksonian voters, Congress did not overrule the veto, and from there, Jackson established state banks, later called pet banks, by political opponents. With the new influx of money in these smaller banks, Many of them used the banks for loans for land out west, basically land speculation. In many ways, this created land grabs out west, which helped populate these new territories which desperately needed to be populated, but it also caused huge inflation. In Jackson's final year as president, he attempted to quell the inflation by requiring that the payment for government land must be conducted in gold and silver. During the Panic of 1837, Half of the banks in the United States failed, and unemployment got up to 25% in some states. Okay, so how can I defend Jackson for this when he clearly caused the panic, right? Right? Well, yes, his monetary policies did not help, but it's not all Jackson. With or without the new influx of loans, land speculation out west was getting ridiculous, so naturally a bubble formed. Though the influx of money helped grow the bubble, the bubble would have existed with or without pet bank loans. Moreover, the price of cotton started to drastically decline. Mixed with the British restricting their loan policies, a panic was going to happen. Additionally, I sort of see Jackson's actions as justifiable considering how corrupt the Second Bank of the United States was. Think about how dangerous having foreign influence on the central bank would have if this trend continued. The Second Bank needed to go, and Jackson just so happened to be the one to do it. Also, in regards to only allowing the purchase of federal land with gold and silver, you'll find no complaints from me here, considering I'm a gold standard apologist. But this is my personal bias, so you can take that claim with a pinch of salt. Also, this is my favorite Jackson feat. He's the only president in U.S. history to get the national debt to zero, so I will never talk crap about someone who does that. Part 4. Jackson's Accomplishments Now that I've gone over the main criticisms of Jackson, I feel it is time to go over some of Jackson's accomplishments to show why we should still teach about him in schools. First, I want to go over the nullification crisis, which is probably going to be the most boring thing I go over in this video, so sorry. In 1828, the Tariff of 1828 was passed. Wow, really creative name, guys. Anyway, Southerners believed that the tariff only benefited northern industrialists. Wanting to appease the southern states, Jackson passed the Tariff of 1832. South Carolina and Jackson's own vice president, John C. Calhoun, declared that both tariffs were null and void in the state of South Carolina, and even threatened to succeed from the Union. 
Jackson could have reacted very harshly, but he instead acted with democratic means by enforcing the force bill, which allowed federal troops to enforce the bill, and the tariff of 1833, which was a compromise bill to help the southern states. With the compromise bill, South Carolina eventually rescinded their nullification, officially ending the threat of an early civil war. The nullification crisis is important because it set the precedent that states could not threaten to succeed whenever they disagreed on a bill. So, Jackson single-handedly stopped the civil war. I think that's pretty notable. Another accomplishment that I have not mentioned is Jackson's military career. Though Jackson was a brilliant, brilliant, and more brilliant against fighting the Creek Indians, I instead want to talk about the Battle of New Orleans. Before you say it, yes, I am very aware that the War of 1812 technically ended when the battle was fought, but Jackson and his men didn't know that, and certainly the British didn't know that. Anyway, during the Battle of New Orleans, Jackson successfully won the battle with 5,000 troops against the British 7,500 troops. What is even more notable was there were 2,037 casualties for the British, while only 71 for the Americans. Jackson won a battle with virtually no casualties with a third less troops. This was one of the most one-sided affairs of the war in 1812, and it was the last notable win for the Americans. The Battle of New Orleans cemented Old Hickory as an American hero, and gave us a great Johnny Horton song. You should check it out. Though I have heard the criticism that Jackson fired hundreds of federal workers and gave the jobs to his political friends via what is known as the spoil system, this cannot be further from the truth. Jackson eliminated many of these federal jobs because he believed that to combat corruption that you would need gradual shifts of federal positions. Prior to this, federal jobs were ripe with corruption and in some ways were modeled by British lordships where jobs would be passed down from generation to generation. Moreover, to combat corruption, Jackson would run investigations in all cabinet offices to rid executive branch of corrupt officials, while Jackson also asked Congress to reform embezzlement laws and reduce fraudulent applications for federal pensions. Though some of Jackson's friends did get jobs, he did an excellent job of ridding the federal government of eternal corruption. Last, and frankly, one of the most impressive Jackson accomplishments was how he was a champion for the common man. Prior to Jackson taking office, many politicians came from a very elitist background. The election of 1824 should be a prime example, considering John Quincy Adams went to Harvard, worked in politics since he was 14, and was the son of President John Adams. Jackson, on the other hand, was from a poor family and grew up in the wilderness of North Carolina. Jackson received very little education and in many ways was a self-made man. In fact, he was the first president who came from west of the Appalachian Mountains. We should not underestimate how important Jacksonian democracy was, and the best exhibit of the spread of Jacksonian democracy is the establishment of universal white male suffrage. Prior to Jackson implementing universal white male suffrage to vote in the United States, you needed to be a property owner. This obviously barred the majority of possible voters from voting in elections and made politics a very elitist practice. By eliminating the property requirements and tax qualifications, overnight, common working Americans could decide who could hold the highest offices. In many ways, every American can attribute their right to vote through Jacksonian democracy. And frankly, we need to teach future students about that. In conclusion, I think that Jackson and his interactions with Native Americans should be fair game for history classes, considering these are untold stories that frankly every history student should learn about. Simultaneously though, I do feel that Jacksonian democracy also needs to be taught considering common Americans can participate in our democracy because of Jackson. In regards to the crazy stuff, I think we should take it as 19th century propaganda and funny stories that were normal for the time period. But seriously guys, can we please bring back duels? Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you want more in defense of videos. Um, I'm thinking about in defense of Columbus, in defense of Lincoln, maybe in defense of Grant, um, possibly 
open the can of worms and defend a Confederate leader like Stonewall Jackson or General Lee, or I might go more modern with uh, President Nixon. I frankly don't know. But remember to like and subscribe for more videos. Thanks, guys.